To start, for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, we are based on campus in University College Dublin, and we are the designated testing facility for Ebola virus disease in Ireland. And the WHO has designated that diagnostic testing for Ebola virus should be done in a biosafety level 3 facility, which we have in our laboratory. We are also a member of the European Network for Diagnostics of Imported Viral Diseases, and this is something that we have been planning for for a very long time. Um, as I said, any details that you may require are available on our website, and we'll make the slides available there as well. Uh, so according to the ECDC, for the laboratory diagnosis of Ebola, there are two methods. Firstly, is the isolation of Ebola virus from a clinical specimen. Now, in fact, to culture Ebola, you need a very high containment level laboratory, and there are very few of these in the world. So this test is not available in Ireland, uh, and certainly will be difficult to access. Uh, serology testing for Ebola, as Dr. Sheehan alluded to earlier, is not very useful in the acute setting because it takes about 8 to 10 days to get detectable antibody levels. So really the diagnosis of Ebola as it stands is based on molecular techniques. So we detect uh, virus nucleic acid in the clinical specimen and we also need to confirm it in a second assay which uses a second uh, target, genetic target, to make the diagnosis. <coughs> Uh, so the methodology then, again, you just we've seen this uh, picture in earlier uh, slides. Uh, Ebola virus is a single-stranded RNA virus. Um, it's got 19 kilobase um, uh, genome sequence, and it encodes for several viral proteins. So the test that we use, we've got two tests to be in URL. The first is a commercial assay, which targets the L gene, which is the polymerase gene of the Ebola virus. And the second assay is an in-house assay. This is a test we have designed ourselves which detects the gut protein gene of the Ebola virus. So we have two assays which detect two different targets for Ebola, and they are run in parallel on the sample that we receive. Uh, so requesting a test for Ebola virus disease, it's very important, I think, at this stage to make reference to the excellent risk assessment algorithm that's available on the HPSC website. And the diagnosis and uh, the decision to ask or to request an Ebola virus test should be based on a risk assessment. Uh, and the details of that are available on the algorithm and through the HPSC website. But once you've made the decision uh, to request the Ebola test, then all the information that you need is on this form. And essentially, the sample type that we require is an EDTA blood sample and also a whole clot of blood or a serum sample. So we ideally request two different sample types. Um, the contact details for the NVRL uh, are available on this form. There's an in hours uh, telephone number and then there's an out for hours mobile number. And this was a very important thing to stress is that we are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to perform testing in patients where there is a high risk exposure. Um, so then just as was in relation to how do you get the samples to the NVRL, um, uh, in this case Ebola is characterized as a category A infectious substance. And this has very specific requirements in terms of packaging and in terms of transport, which most microbiology laboratories are familiar with. And indeed, of all the samples that we've tested to date, the packaging which has arrived at the NVRL has been excellent and completely in line with regulations. Um, so, so just for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the additional packaging really relates to the protection that's provided to the sample as it's transported. Um, and again, all this information is very um, easily accessible on the website. So what happens? Uh, when you uh, alert us to a sample arriving to the NVRL, a staff member will be there to receive the sample when it arrives uh, through the designated courier. It doesn't go through our normal specimen uh, reception, it's taken immediately to our Biosafety Level 3 facility, uh, which is a laboratory that meets all the requirements, and uh, certain uh, security access requirements, it's got uh, specific air handling, disinfection disposal procedures, and also protective equipment and training. Um, so the sample is taken immediately up to the Biosafety Level 3 uh, facility. Uh, there are two staff members involved, um, again, in a sort of buddy system for testing uh, these samples. And it's very important that you let us know in advance that the samples are arrived, because this gives our staff a chance to prepare. Uh, and also, we need to prepare the laboratory. So the safety cabinets have to be uh, turned on, and the air handling unit has to be turned on and run for at least 20 minutes before we can start the testing procedure. So again, if you know the samples on the way, we can have this already in place before it arrives. Um, so the sample then is taken inside into the laboratory and the specimen is unpacked within the safety cabinet in the biosafety level 3 facility. And this is quite a, I suppose, I just I suppose to classify why did it take so long to unpack the specimen um, and to process the specimen in the centrifuging. There is a number of steps that need to be taken and uh, some contamination that occurs between these steps as well. So 
uh, and again, it's two staff, one, one staff member performing the testing, another assistant, and also observing that no um, accidental inoculation occurs. Um, once the sample has been processed, the first step in a PCR um, extraction is the RNA extraction, and at this stage we add a chemical, which is guanidine pyocyanate, and once that chemical is added to the sample, the sample is no longer infectious, and we can take it out of our, um, our BL3 laboratory and bring it downstairs into our routine diagnostic laboratory and process it. And in fact, the PCR test that we do is run on the machines in our, uh, in our uh, level uh, two category. Uh, so I suppose all this process uh, is, is taking place, and then I suppose the most important thing is the result interpretation, a positive or a negative test, and finally, communication of the results. And I suppose at this stage, I'd just like to stress that we are incredibly aware of how important this result is and how urgent uh, the result is required, both positive and negative results, and that we endeavor to get this result back as quickly as possible. And one of the issues that we've kind of noticed over the past couple of weeks in the testing that we've done, who have all been in low-risk patients, is that there has been a number of different, I suppose, confusion about where the result would be phoned to and who would receive the result first. And maybe I, it's something I'd ask people to consider today um, in general, we will phone the result back to the person who rings us to let us know the sample is coming and discuss the case with us, so usually the named consultant. But this should be fed back to staff within the department so that the anxiety levels are reduced uh, and that they know that once the result is there, it will be communicated back as quickly as possible. And we'd also ask that staff members in the wards and the laboratory do not ring the, do not ring the NVR and to look for the test result because we will, as soon as we have it available, we will let you know. Uh, so the question, this was just asked earlier, what is the turnaround time? We would anticipate that in the majority of cases we would have a result within six hours of receipt of the sample in the NVRL. Um, we also get asked about the sensitivity. So that is how good is the test? How do we know that it's a negative result is a negative result? Um, so I suppose there are different factors that play on this. And firstly in relation to the assays, as I mentioned, we have two separate tests. They target two separate targets. One is a commercial test. And that's the one that is currently being used in the outbreak in West Africa, and it seems to be performing very well with no evidence that there's any mutations that are making it less effective. The second test we have is an in-house assay we've designed and we have experience of use over the years, and we have been involved for a number of years in, in this network <coughs> across Europe of uh, laboratories that deal with these kind of pathogens, and we have been involved in proficiency testing. And in fact, we are expecting uh, in the uh, very near future a broader panel of proficiency testing for Ebola, which we will be testing our, our um, assays again. And always our tests are performed uh, to a very high standard in comparison with the other laboratories. Um, the sample type, as I said, we prefer to get an EDTA blood sample, that is the best specimen to collect. Um, what we say is that we would accept a sample within 12 hours if it had been drawn from the patient. We would certainly hope that a sample would get to the end of before 12 hours. Um, and uh, as I say, the typing then, in terms of the patient factors, it's very difficult. It depends on what stage the patient presents and what kind of symptoms they have in terms of what viral load is detectable in the blood. Um, and so if you get a negative result, um, the decision on whether the patient needs to be retested it very much depends on the risk exposure and the risk assessment that's been carried on, and also it would be a case-by-case -case discussion. The WHO recommend that if it's in the first, uh, within three days of onset of symptoms and <coughs> negative result, you may need to repeat. And certainly this is something we will discuss on a case-by-case -case situation. We may do it um, sooner than 48 hours. It very much depends on the individual. So the specificity then, what's the likelihood of a false positive? It's just to say that to date, as uh, we've uh, tested 15 patients to date, and they've all been negative with no um, concerns. Um, again, the specificity, with, because we use two separate tests of two different targets and they run in parallel, we're very confident, I suppose, that we will we have reduced the risk of having false positive results. Um, so what are the key messages, really, just to say that I would really recommend referring to the Ebola virus disease algorithm, which is in place. All the information, particularly in relation to contacting the NPRL and uh, the samples that are required, is on that uh, single sheet. Uh, please, please contact us before you send the sample. We can be prepared, and again, this will cut down on the time it takes to get the results back. And finally, just that the results will be communicated to the designated person as soon as they are available, and just maybe to look at your own um, institution and how communication, how that result will be conveyed to the people on the ground. So, thank you.